Marisa Brown with APQC. Thank you so much for joining today's webinar on leading practices in procurement transformation, next generation concepts to drive strategy, efficiency, and customer service. Procurement organizations have evolved quite a bit over the past 15 years. Many have shifted away from a largely decentralized model to one that is more centralized, but experience has taught us that centralization is not the same as developing an efficient yet connected procurement service delivery model. Many have looked for improvements through new areas of focus, like automation, strategic sourcing, and category management. But challenges still remain, including unclear roles, ineffective use of technology, sufficient levels of rework, and poor customer service. So during this webinar, thought leaders from Scott Madden are going to share some next generation procurement transformation concepts. So now I'd like to introduce our two speakers. First, we have Trey Robinson. Trey is the co-lead of Scott Madden's Supply Chain Community of Practice. He specializes in financial advisory and multifunction shared services design, implementation, and improvement. With 25 years of consulting experience, Trey brings extensive knowledge in creating and implementing shared services strategies, leading major corporate initiatives, and improving profitability for client companies. We also have with us today, John Francis. He is co-lead of Scott Madden's Supply Chain Community of Practice with Trey. John specializes in end-to-end -end supply chain management, including procurement transformation, procurement service delivery, logistics and materials management. His project work has touched many industries, including energy, logistics, and manufacturing. In addition, John has many years of day-to-day -day practical experience as an industry leader. And with that, I will turn it over to Trey. Hi, thank you, Marisa. Uh, welcome, everybody. Thank you for taking time out of your Thursdays to join us for today's webinar. Uh, we'll be covering four overall topics today. Um, first of all, we want to tell you a little bit about Scott Madden. You may not have heard of us, so I'll spend just a minute or two uh, walking you through who we are. And then I'm going to turn it over to John, and John is going to walk us through the procurement service delivery model. What are those concepts or those things that make this model unique and we think make it very valuable for companies over the next several years? Then I'll pick back up with the procurement service delivery implementation, uh, sharing ways that we can transition from thinking about the model to actually implementing it and what some of those leading practices we've learned from implementing this over the years. And then finally, we'll reserve 10 to 15 minutes for questions at the end of today's discussion. Okay, let's jump straight in and tell you just a little bit about who Scott Madden is. We are a general management consulting firm. Uh, we got started back in 1983 as a firm focused on the utility industry for gas and electric utilities. And then during the 1980s, what happened was that industry began to diversify. And they began to buy companies that were not regulated, uh, that were very different from, from those that they had traditionally uh, led. And so we helped them set up what they called service companies it provided back office services like finance, HR, and supply chain to the regulated entities as well as the deregulated entities. But to do that right, you had to make sure that you tracked and managed which services were consumed by whom so that all of the rules were followed. That service company was the forerunner to today's shared services organization. And after doing it for a number of years in the 1980s, we launched our own shared services practice in the early 1990s. And so today we still have those two practices, one focused on utilities and the second focused on corporate and shared services across all industries. Since the early 1990s, we've completed more than 2,100 projects in this space, ranging from assessments through detailed designs, implementations, and improvements. Uh, as I mentioned before, we've covered all industries uh, with our corporate and shared services work. And our focus is really on uh, supply chain, finance, HR, IT, and other business services like real estate and facilities or communications uh, or other examples that might uh, benefit from a, a service delivery model improvement. Overall, we have over 200 consultants focused at Scott Madden and we cover um, most of the work in the Americas as well as around the world. As I mentioned before, we provide uh, services from that full, full life cycle, from assess and plan through improvement. 
Uh, on this slide, you can see several of the different types of services that we provide. For those companies that are thinking about a new service delivery model, but yet but haven't yet uh, implemented it, we provide assessments. Uh, oftentimes, these are smaller companies that are growing rapidly um, and are now ready for and have the scale to support a new delivery model. And in other cases, uh, they are large companies that have grown through acquisition and are now taking the time to step back and evaluate how a new model might support them. We get involved in detailed design around current state analysis, future state conceptual models, um, organizational design, technology evaluation, and change management support. Um, we spend a good bit of our time actually helping implement the models that we design. One of those things that we think differentiates us from our competitors is that about 60% of our work is in implementation, rolling up our sleeves and actually getting the work done, which means that we do a good job, we think, in designing these models in a way that are actionable and implementable. And then finally, we help our clients with improvement. Uh, imp improvements can range from things like expanding their current delivery models to new services or to new geographies or to new internal customers, to setting up uh, data science and analytics centers of expertise, to helping them uh, implement new intelligent automation capabilities. Specific to our supply chain practice, um, John and I like to take an end-to-end -end focus on what it means to provide supply chain services. And so we provide a range of services from planning and forecasting through sourcing, procurement, logistics, materials management, and we include AP as part of this end-to-end -end process. Most of you probably think of AP as a finance function and in most organizations it is, but when we consider a supply chain service, we wanna look at the end-to-end -end model and think of the end-to-end -end process. Our work has been recently revolving around large scale supply chain and procure to pay transformations, uh, which you can see here on the right. But we also do a good bit of work in more tailored solutions like category management program design, spend analytics, uh, warehouse design, or technology evaluation. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to John and he is going to walk us through those components of an efficient but connected procurement service delivery model. John. Thank you, Trey. Welcome again to all of you who are joining us. This section of our discussion will provide context for and define what exactly a procurement service delivery model is. As you can see on this title slide, our approach for a procurement service delivery model is meant to achieve efficiency while remaining connected to stakeholders and customers such as vendors and the business units they serve. You've already heard Trey and others mention efficient and connected as a phrase. We emphasize that with our clients in designing a procurement service delivery model. And so let's get started. There we go. I think you guys can see the screen. So we think it's important to start off with a little context highlighting the evolution of the transformation of procurement. Prior to the mid 2000, uh, prior to the mid 2000s, forgive me, prior to the mid 2000s, procurement groups focused on executing purchases on behalf of business unit customers. Those groups were still often decentralized or partially centralized and their work consisted of, consisted of administrative and transactional activities, such as creating and administering purchase orders. Then around the beginning of the mid to late 2000s, procurement groups began to emphasize strategic procurement as a way to realize financial benefits of conducting three things, analysis of the market, number one, analysis of suppliers, number two, and analysis of their spend, and those three inputs inform their sourcing strategies. They also began aggregating demand, consolidating suppliers, improving negotiations, and developing strategic supplier relationships. However, during these years, both transactional activities and strategic activities were often performed by the same people, leading to inefficient models. Procurement service delivery is the new model many are moving to today. It aligns the organization 
to the work being performed in a manner that efficiently delivers service while also reaping the rewards of strategic buying and providing for improved productivity, efficiency, and technology enablement. The technology enablement point is one that we'll discuss more later, but we hear from clients that one of their ongoing challenges is to make sure that they don't view technology as a silver bullet, that it actually provides the benefit. And in this case, we will talk about service management technologies as a key consideration in your overall technology portfolio. Further, the procurement groups have started to understand their impacts on accounts payable. This has led to both procurement and AP beginning to move towards an end-to-end -end purchase to pay process as a way to be more efficient and optimize service where you establish a single owner of the end-to-end -end process, you drive a stronger mandate towards standardization of policies and processes while still retaining a separate organization to execute the day-to-day -day operations. And so that's a little bit of background on where procurement has, has traveled over the last couple of decades. We're gonna move to a live polling exercise to engage the audience a little bit. So which of the following applies to your procurement function? Is the strategic procurement group centralized? Is the operational procurement group centralized? Is AP centralized? The third option is, is AP and operational procurement centralized? And you can think of operational procurement as purchasing, some people still call it. Are all three groups centralized, AP, purchasing, and strategic sourcing? Or are none of them centralized? Pick the radio dial that applies to you. We're waiting for the results to come in. So as expected, AP is definitely centralized, but 29% have all three groups centralized. And then there's a smaller percentage where none are centralized. They're still in a decentralized model. So that was interesting. Here, we want to discuss proficiency in all three areas. The live polling we just did together was to focus everyone's mind on three capabilities in procurement, which are depicted here on this slide. Number one, customer service in procurement is largely felt in operational procurement. Customer service is a concept where the number of people that are interacting with the business units and vendors are at its highest. And so being responsive in this area is very key. The middle area, developing impactful sourcing strategies is a goal of procurement overall, but it's also a key selling point to the business units to maintain their support for the goals of procurement. If you can show them that you are providing impactful sourcing strategies, they'll support your overall effort more often. Then finally, the third area to the right there, end-to-end -end ownership of spend categories to drive value in key categories. It's an ongoing effort, but the key here is it doesn't end when the contract is signed. It continues throughout. The point that we wanna get across on this slide is it really requires a, a balance of excellence in all three areas. Some companies focus heavily on advancing their skills to adopt category management, and they view that as the end of the journey or the sole destination. What they end up doing is taking for granted that customer service and responsiveness is felt in operational procurement. We would suggest a balanced approach where you consider all three areas equally and being excellent in all three areas as important. Let's go to our second live polling event. Which of the following applies to your procurement function? Executives at my company emphasize category management, strategic procurement, 
and operational procurement equally. Executives at my company emphasize category management over strategic procurement and operational procurement or executives at my company have plans to implement category management and have not yet installed it. Please pick the answer that applies to you. Well, I wouldn't have expected that. Well, I guess it's not that much of a surprise, but that first point is one we're gonna focus on. Executives at my company emphasize category management, strategic procurement and operational procurement equally. For the second response where it's emphasizing category management over strategic procurement and operational procurement, that's often a sign that maybe there's a problem. Let's go to the next slide and discuss this a little further. So the polling we just did is a glimpse into deciding if you have symptoms of a problem. Expanding on that a little bit, how do you know if procurement service delivery has problems or maybe needs to be refined and updated? Here we depict some of the, the symptoms that we see in the market or we hear from our customers. They'll often say, number one, when there are competing priorities in day-to-day -day fires, the strategic work loses and the transactional work wins and becomes a priority. We'll also hear them say that operational procurement excellence is overlooked as a contributor to business satisfaction. So answering emails and phone calls is not valued and category management is more valued. The third area, savings achievement is negotiated but not achieved after the contract is signed. The fourth area, over time, a focus on cost reduction provides fewer and fewer benefits. So this leads to some uncertainty about how we're, the procurement function is going to demonstrate to the business unit that they are providing value. And then finally, the fifth area, the feedback loop from accounts payable to the upstream areas does not lead to improvements things like invoice discrepancies or vendors not being clear on payment terms gets in the way of concepts like evaluated receipt settlement, for example. This is our final uh, live polling event. Uh, in this case, which of the following applies to your P2P end-to-end -end process? Number one, we have a landing page where all customers, both internal and external, are directed for service. Number two, we have several vendor portals that provide different services. Number three, we do not have a landing page or vendor portals. Please pick the answer that applies to you. So 22% of you have one landing page where all vendors and internal customers are directed. 41% of you have several portals that provide different services, which is what we see commonly. 37% of you don't have a landing page at all. Uh, we'll talk about landing pages here when we get into our tiered model, particularly at tier zero. Thank you for participating in all three polls. Let's take that information from the symptoms and, and go a level deeper and continue the conversation about how do you know you may need to consider designing your service model or refining an existing model. So some of you already have portals. Some of you already have landing pages. You may need to refine your model. Other, others of you don't have landing pages and portals and maybe you might be at the beginning of your journal of your journey. In this case, some of the symptoms, we've got three of the biggest ones. First one there you see listed is unclear roles, where roles are not clearly defined. 
the transactional roles are being asked to be executed by strategic folks or strategic roles are completing transactional work and then they don't have any time to do anything else. And you'll hear people say, I don't have time to be strategic. Or they'll say daily firefighting dominates their day. Those are classic symptoms. The second one there is what we call activity without achievement. Business units and vendors see procurement as requiring steps that cost time or that are unnecessary and get in the way. Or more often they'll say that procurement doesn't understand my business. They'll say things like submitting a request is painful, it's not needed, I've got to go through too many hoops to get an answer. This third area is really a segue to the next slide where uncertain service access is a feature. Um, procurement has centralized activities and their staff, but the business unit partners start to feel abandoned. Business unit partners are feel uncertain about how to get things done. And in some cases, we've seen business unit folks set up their own procurement activities in their shops to do things like expediting. Uh, we call that shadow procurement. So they'll say things like, who do I call to expedite my material now that Jim is no longer sitting next to me? Uh, those are classic problems. If you take these same three areas and say, well, how do we solve for them? so that we have clear roles, effective processes and systems, and support options that are accessible. We think that this is what good looks like, where for uh, clear role definitions, where the transactional roles perform primarily standardized, repeatable work, and strategic roles are prim primarily assigned to complex, non-standard work, and then you match the skills of the staff to the work they are assigned. Solving for effective processes and systems, this is where the business unit partners and vendors start to see procurement as efficient and the staff as effective liaisons for their needs. Uh, and the overall set of processes and systems are enablers to those activities. At the bottom there, the accessible support options is where we start to talk about procure tiered procurement service delivery where there is support through a robust tier zero direct access portal. And then the centralized groups have tiers one, two and COEs that support them. And so we're gonna expand on the tiered model here on our next slide. So let's go a level deeper on what is a tiered service delivery model in procurement. Many people experience tiered delivery in other functions like HR and IT. In procurement, this concept is one that Scott Madden has been designing over the last three to five years as procurement has turned the corner and leveraged some of the concepts that is seen in HR and IT. So what does procurement tiered service delivery look like? The first is the first tier is tier zero, direct access. Some people, We'll think of that as self-service. We call that direct access because the concept of self-service sounds like you're getting your customers to do their own work. Our view of it is you're providing them a shorter path to get to the information and services that they need. So we call it direct access. You'll see, see things like templates for RFIs, RFQs, and RFPs, FAQs, um, case tools for ticketing like you see in other functions are often put in place. And you can complete and route purchase requisitions, change orders, and suppliers have a place to go to update inf their information or be onboarded. So this is the tier zero direct access that's largely uh, not uh, something that's supported by staff, but rather by service management tools. When you get to tier one, we call that customer service. Here is there's a mix of customer support and transaction processing. Lots of calls, lots of emails. Uh, and oftentimes if you have a case management system, you'll see a ticketing solution in place. And this is where recs get turned to POs and routine operational procurement issues are handled. When you get to the second tier special services, things get escalated for uh, issue resolution 
or transact or activities that require complex processes. So think about expediting or punching out supplier catalogs and things. We call these tier zero, tier one, and tier two, the procurement service center. And the overall workload is anywhere from 60 to 75% of the workload in procurement. If necessary, things will go to a center of expertise, which you see off to the right there, we call that tier three, and it's primarily strategic and analytical work that requires judgment, uh, strategic sourcing, spend market analysis, supplier performance management, analysis of inventory and other reporting, continuous improvement activities are found here. And this roughly accounts for 20 to 25% of the workload. In answering the question, how do these tiers help? For the unclear roles problem that we discussed, procurement activities are defined, measured, but they're also deliberately placed in the specific tier where they belong. And then the skills needed for each activity and each tier are aligned to the model and the organization is built around that. So that clarifies everyone's roles that we talked about earlier. For the other two areas, activity without achievement and uncertain service access, one of the key features of this is that processes are redesigned and optimized for the chosen channel they are part of. And then finally, service management technologies enable the overall model and help route work according to rules that are embedded in the service management technologies towards the step in the process they are meant for. And all of this is clearly documented uh, with desktop procedures and process maps that are accessible through a knowledge base. And so that's another level of detail on the tiered model. Let's go to just a quick view here on how does the work move so that it's efficient and connected. We have here the tiers that we just discussed. And if you're a customer on the left-hand side there, you're usually using a, a mobile phone, a desktop, or an actual phone uh, to start your process. And so the work is designed or the model is designed so that if you need to get to tier three, you can go directly there. Um, if you need to access tier one and tier two, you start in tier zero and escalate through there, sometimes with a ticketing system, if you have a more mature uh, tiered model. And so the work will flow through here if you start in tier zero, but at times it will direct you straight to the part of the model that you need to go to. And that's why we think it's efficient and more connected. If it's done right, your business unit customers and your vendors will know exactly where to go for help instead of always calling their favorite person. At the beginning of this discussion, we talked a little bit, bit about enabling technologies, <clears throat> and we've emphasized this concept of being efficient and connected. In this case, enabling technologies really help you be efficient, but also connected in each of the tiers of the model. And so we've got those four boxes across the top to describe some of the technologies that enable each tier. The tier zero direct access <clears throat> tier that we talked about, you'll often see a landing page or a portal and it's one place to go, a unified portal if you wanna think of it that way. There's usually a knowledge base with um, articles and FAQs and video content. And you'll even start to see some artificial intelligence and chat bots that can answer some questions. When you go to tier one, well, which we call customer service, this is where you start getting into telephony um, with automatic dialers and intelligent voice recognition. You'll get the case management that kicks off tickets. The case management piece is important because you'll know how long things take and whether they've been closed. Whereas right now, often times people are using email platforms to manage their work. Uh, the knowledge base is a powerful tool here where there will be reference materials for people working in tier one to know exactly what their steps are in their part of the process. And here's where you'll start to see more robust robotics process automation capabilities 
and additional AI capabilities, a lot of them found in contract administration. In tier two, this is where some of the intelligent workflow happens with your case management system and additional RPA capabilities can be built out. And then finally in the COEs, the centers of expertise, here's where you'll get some of the modules in your ERP or some of your bolt-on solutions for contract management, supplier relationship management, and some of your analytics capabilities. We think that viewing the technology piece of your overall service model as an enabler is key. When you think about technologies as a silver bullet, the tail starts to wag the dog where you build your processes around the technology and pray and hope that the business case is realized. In this case, technologies are enabler, not the solution themselves. And so with that, I'll turn it over to Trey, who's gonna to talk to us about procurement service delivery implementation. All right, thank you, John. Uh, hopefully folks now have a better idea of what uh, this model looks like and the technologies that enable it. That's a tiered delivery model that tries to align skills with work. But you might be thinking to yourself, well, that's great, but how do I get started? How do I know if it's right for me? And so what we often will encourage our clients to do is start with an assessment whether we provide the assessment or another consulting firm or, or you do it internally, it's important to start off with really understanding your current situation. And so for us, we think that involves five inputs, which you can see on this screen. Uh, first of all, site visits and interviews. Uh, we encourage folks to do a number of interviews with executives to help guide strategy, with functional folks to make sure that you understand processes and then with some internal customers as well to make sure you have a point of view from the customer. We find these interviews are very helpful because oftentimes we'll rely on data to tell you what's happening, but you don't understand why it's happening without the interviews. The interviews provide context around things like business constraints, risks you weren't aware of, history that exists that uh, informs why you are where you are. The second thing we would encourage as an input is a work activity assessment. Uh, you can do this a number of different ways from Excel to uh, surveys and other methods. Uh, but the intent of the work activity survey uh, assessment is to understand uh, exactly where work is performed, how much work is performed, who is performing the work. What we'll often find is if you look at um, org charts, you may realize that folks whose title might be one thing is very different than the actual work that they're performing. And so doing an assessment to understand that is important. You may also find that there are people that you did not realize were uh, part of this, doing this work at all. They're not part of the organization, not part of supply chain. Maybe they're an administrative assistant who's actually doing some purchasing. There are things that you wanna capture through this study that's not maybe relevant or, or apparent just from looking at an org chart. So we would encourage a work activity assessment. It helps baseline a business case and really inform how work is being performed today. The third input, a performance metric assessment, that is focused on benchmarks, making sure you gather data that you can use to compare how you're doing relative to benchmarks. That work activity assessment provides FTE data so that you can compare how many um, full-time equivalents you have performing work relative to uh, leading practice. You can also look at other metrics overall, whether it's around efficiency or overall performance that you can use uh, to understand how you're doing today. And these um, benchmarks also inform what the future state ought to look like because it helps you size the organization as you think about what the model might look like in the future. When we think of benchmarks, we tend to think of them as directional. You know, a lot of people will, will try to compare apples to apples and as you all know, benchmarks are difficult to get a true apples to apples comparison. And so we view it as directional, it's a guide uh, and, it, and it helps inform how, you, how to size that, that future model. But you don't necessarily need to be in the top quartile in, every, in, in everything. You need to think about where it makes sense to be top quartile, where it might make sense to be a little bit lower because being top quartile costs money and based on your objectives and goals, there may be times where it's not appropriate. Fourth, a customer satisfaction survey. If you don't do internal customer satisfaction today, we would encourage you to, to do that at the beginning of this sort of uh, an assessment. Uh, it helps get, give an understanding of exactly how satisfied customers are today with services of yours that they use, how important they find their services, 
and how satisfied they are with those services. We think it's critical to do this because as you implement, significant change takes place. And what might you guess? Internal satisfaction will go down. It's typically what happens. We see degradation of about four to five percent during the transformation, largely due to the change. But then once the transformation is complete, we see internal customer satisfaction meeting or exceeding where it was prior to the transformation taking place. And after a year or two of being transformed, it's uh, substantively higher than it was when you started. But it's important to measure where you are at the beginning so you can understand that over time. And then finally, leading practice uh, adoption analysis. Take a look at how you compare to others from a leading practices perspective. We look at that in two ways. One is around um, the depth of the practice. How fully are you completing the leading practice internally? The second is around the breadth of that leading practice. Are you performing that practice everywhere in every business unit and every location the same way? And so those two things help inform um, the overall assessment as well. And so taking these five inputs, you're able to, to have a firm view of your current operations. It informs how you might build that design or conceptual model for a procurement service delivery. And then it guides, uh, provides input for a business case and guides a roadmap for improvement. Once you've done that assessment, those results help inform the model design. And so on this slide, we've actually uh, pulled four examples from a real client that we've cleansed for today's purposes, but provides you uh, some insight into to what you actually see when you do this sort of analysis. And so on the top left, you see assessment findings. These are interview findings that we, uh, that we gather from our clients. Part of what we look at when we do an interview is we wanna understand um, policy and process. We want to understand organization and staffing. We want to look at tools and technology. We want to understand data and metrics. Uh, we also like to get a sense of change readiness. You know, how ready are they to actually to, to, to make a change? And so those are some of the findings that you see in that top left. Moving over to the top right, you'll see it says service placement. So this is a big step in the design that we encourage uh, each of our clients to go through. Um, once you understand where work is performed today from that work assessment, you're able to get a sense of by activity, how many full-time equivalents are doing the work. Well, now based on the model that John described, when you think about the tiered model of tier one for transactional work and tier two for more complex transactions, tier three for your centers of expertise, you can begin to assign each of those activities to a different tier in the overall model. And that allows you to get a sense of how large each tier ought to be in the future state. We encourage you to do this in a workshop format, if at all possible, because having different people involved in the process not only makes sure that the work is transparent, but it also um, is a, a change management technique that allows them to be part of the process and to have buy-in as it relates to the future model. The bottom left, you can see policy process and procedure alignment. In order to build any service delivery model and be effective, you need to harmonize your processes. Um, we think harmonization works best in a workshop environment as well, with representatives from various areas coming together to work through how best to get to a single or, or fewer processes than you have today to do the same sorts of activities. And then finally, on the bottom right, the conceptual design, leveraging the benchmarks that we talked about earlier, leveraging the service placement exercise and getting a sense of um, your organization's experience, you can begin to build this conceptual design. I know you can't see it clearly, but on the bottom left, the green items, those are the tier one items that John mentioned, 20 to 25% of the work. The gray items are tier two, more complex uh, transactional type work. And then the blue items are centers of expertise, which is gonna be that analytical and strategic work around category management or spend analytics. So these types of things you're able to build coming out of this initial assessment and beginning your detailed design. Once you get into the implementation and you really are thinking about how to take this from this conceptual design through a full implementation, we encourage you to think about the work streams on this slide. I'll, I'll touch on each of these quickly and then we'll move on. But to give you a sense of what's included, start with planning and project management. Um, at the beginning of the project, determine who your team is gonna be, how many people you wanna have on a core team, uh, how you're gonna report status, man manage risks, manage a work plan, 
Um, so think through these things early on with planning and project management. As you all, I'm sure, are aware, this, this work stream will last through the duration of the implementation. Next, policies, processes, and procedures. Here you can get a sense of those policies, processes, and procedures I mentioned on the prior slide, how to harmonize those and how to think about what the redesign might look like. The third work stream is around organization and staffing. And so we talked about the organizational model, but this is a much more detailed um, implementation activities around what those actual job descriptions look like. How are you going to staff this? Are you going to use a slotting exercise where you take people from today and slot them into future roles? Are you going to go with a zero-based staffing approach where everyone applies for every job? How are you going to manage that? And then a big portion of this role is also around managing the transitions. Folks moving from one organization to another, new folks being hired, others electing to leave. So managing uh, that census tracking, we call it, is, is going to be critical. The fourth work stream, communication, change management, and training. Uh, here, the focus is really around, at first, understanding stakeholder uh, alignment, understanding where folks sit today, and doing an assessment of your stakeholders. What we often find is that if this is overlooked, you'll have leaders who may not agree with the approach or may be neutral to the approach, and you don't know that. And so you're not able to build a plan to keep them engaged and keep them aligned. So think about that stakeholder alignment work early on in the process. Then you want to build awareness to the new model, uh, focusing on communications. For us, communications really thinks about all of the audiences that are impacted, as well as what different vehicles you might use to communicate, whether it's email or video or brown bag lunches or other means. And then finally, we have the assess the training and build the training plan and, and actually ex executing on that training. Training starts near the end of the implementation before the launch, but it continues after the launch with remediation training because you'll find that once you launch, some folks need a little help um, to remember exactly what they were trained on previously. The fifth work stream is around technologies. John touched on these earlier. We, we think of these in three big buckets. Uh, the first big bucket is the service management technologies. Those technologies like case management, knowledge base, and portal that really um, are about how services delivered, managed, and tracked. The second big bucket of technologies is around functional technologies, leveraging your ERP, considering any sort of spend analytics tools. Maybe there are other third-party solutions that are part of this process from a procurement perspective that you need to incorporate. And then finally, the third area is really around intelligent automation, thinking about things like robotics process automation, maybe there are virtual agents, artificial intelligence, things of that nature that you can incorporate into the model. And then finally, if you have a need for a new facility to co-locate folks, that's certainly something that we often will build a work stream around as well. When you look at this picture, it looks overwhelming, it looks large, and it really is not as large as it appears. Uh, oftentimes, we'll have an individual be in more than one work stream. A good example is for policy and processes. You do that design, and those people naturally are the best ones to help build training because they understand the policies and processes the best. Similarly, it's not uncommon for folks who are part of the organization and staffing work stream to also have a role in communication and change management. So there is some work that can uh, blend across work streams. Finally, think about this from a core team perspective. How big is your core team going to be? Maybe it's six or eight dedicated people. And then there are a number of subject matter experts that are involved throughout the process. On this slide, you get a sense of what the roadmap looks like. This is a real roadmap we pulled from uh, one of our clients. And if you look at this, it looks quite large. It looks like three years. Uh, this is a very large client and a very complex client, so that's definitely on the higher end of how long these sorts of transformations take. Uh, on the low end, we've typically seen transformations as fast as 9 to 12 months, though most of them are often in that 12 to 18 month time frame. If you look at this slide, you can see the various work streams we mentioned on the prior page, all in action. Uh, you can see at, at times many of them are happening at the same time. Uh, and so you need to make sure you manage and coordinate carefully, understanding upstream and downstream implications of your decisions. Uh, a couple other points on this slide, you'll notice a few of them like org design and green uh, has gaps between the various steps. That's because when we build these, we often will build phasing in, into place. So 
early on you're building your staffing and then perhaps you hire as you are ahead of a pilot or an initial launch and then you hire again as you move toward your uh, phased approach for deployment and so you'll notice that on this slide as well and then at the bottom that purple and blue arrow you can see project management change management communication lasting the duration of the initiative a few leading practices that we have seen throughout this process, having done this many times, first of all, and I touched on this earlier, involve stakeholders early and often. Make sure that you understand who your stakeholders are and build detailed plans to engage them, whether that's a weekly meeting or checkpoint or sending them an email status report, uh, but make sure that you engage them early and often and keep them involved and aligned. The second one, top right, uh, implement well-defined tier escalation criteria. What that means is that when questions or inquiries come in to your tier one that are going to answer whether it's a vendor question or an employee question, um, they understand clearly what's within their scope and then how to escalate to a tier two if necessary. If you don't have those clearly established early on, you'll find that the tier one team escalates more than they should to a tier two role, which really begins to defeat the purpose of aligning skills to work. And so make sure you have built use cases for all types of purchases, as well as the types of questions that you might get from folks to make sure you understand what the escalation criteria ought to be. In the purple, make detailed accountabilities clear by group and by role. I think this should be obvious to most folks, but make sure that you have clear uh, roles and responsibilities across all folks involved in the process. We often will use that phrase, mutually exclusive, collectively exhaustive, to make sure that the roles do not have gaps between them, but are also not redundant such that two roles are performing the same activity. And where possible, think about including performance measures by role. In red, aggressively simplify and streamline policies and processes. We talked about process harmonization earlier and how important that is. Getting as simple as you can with a single process where possible is always the best course of action. We think that it creates a consistent and repeatable user experience, customer experience, and it also provides the most efficient model overall. Also think about where you might be able to automate processes that are routine uh, and repeatable throughout, throughout this process as part of your idea of simplifying. In blue, leverage analytics before, during, and after the transition. I touched on this a little bit before, but the idea of making sure that you establish that customer satisfaction baseline, that workload baseline, that cost baseline, that performance baseline, and then measuring performance against those as you uh, transition through the model and through the implementation. That way, when folks uh, in the middle of the process say, hey, wait a second, it was better before. I'm sure this wasn't as difficult previously. You have data to, to refute that and, and data that you can use to measure and manage improvement over time. And finally, treat technology as an enabler, not a panacea. John touched on this as well, but make sure that you think about using technology to uh, improve your process as opposed to being that single thing that makes the process perfect. You need to focus first and foremost on the process blocking and tackling, thinking about technology requirements, thinking about dependencies, and then the technology can create a more fruitful overall experience. A few hallmarks of success. How do you know you got it right? You know, that's one of the questions we often hear. What does good look like? How do I know I got it right? And these are some of those things that we think really explain whether or not you got it right. I'm not gonna go through all of these because we've touched on most of them over the course of the presentation, but there are three that I like to, to point out. The first one is the second check mark. Results can be seen soon after launch. If you've done this properly, you're able to see an uptick in benefits soon after launch. You don't have to wait six or nine months as things stabilize and you begin to get good at it. You should be able to see it soon after launch. So that's something to, to think about. The second one is around making sure that stakeholders understand the process and system changes. If you've done your job properly, then you know that they, they are aware of, of who to contact, they're trained, they understand what's going to happen and they're able to go to the right person. If they have to ask who to go to, then there's a, a challenge with the model and you haven't implemented as effectively as you would have hoped for. And the final thing is that suppliers are aware of the transition. We haven't talked too much about the supplier impact throughout this process, but it's important that you build dedicated vendor campaigns to teach your suppliers about what you're doing, make them aware 
of the new delivery model so that they know how to reach you and how to contact you, provide them the appropriate training that they have. And if you do, they'll understand what's in it for them and why this is a benefit to them and they'll adopt the model quickly. So with that, I think we're coming to the end of the presentation. Thank you all for listening. And now we'd like to open the floor for questions. Thank you, Trey and John. A lot of really great information. And we have a few questions that have come in from the audience. So I'm just gonna pose these to you now. The first one has to do with ESG or environmental, social and governance obligations. And the question is that ESG obligations are becoming more and more in the focus for procurement. What is your view of how organizations need to cater to these requirements along the process? And what are some best practices and how would this look when companies do move toward a tiered procurement organization? Yeah, I'll take that one if, if you're all right with it. Um, I thought this was an excellent question, by the way. And the things that I thought about is, first of all, a lot of the ESG topics are flowing down from policy. Uh, but where that's true, it's one of the things in a tiered service model is to disaggregate the elements of DSG into the process steps and activities that are required to support DSG. So think about topics like supplier diversity, which often would be in a COE um, as a standalone effort, but it also needs support uh, to be done. Some analytics would help, which is a separate activity that is slotted uh, into the model with specific skills uh, that support. There are other things like risk management would also be a COE, but the inputs on risk management, particularly from a data side, come from several areas. And so sliding those inputs into the model would be important. Uh, and so the combination of COEs and disaggregating each of the parts of your ESG policy into discrete uh, activities and that allows you to place those activities that support your ESG policies into the parts of the model. And we are seeing that. There's been some COE development around some of the classic areas that I just mentioned. Great question. Hey, John, I just add quickly that um, you know, within that supplier relationship management for existing suppliers, you can begin to use that capability to, capability to understand, manage and track ESG issues. We'll often see this at the early stage of the process prior to even selecting the vendor or onboarding the vendor to understand things like their trade practices and do they have a carbon plan and are there other ways that, you know, that, that they have implemented ESG um, capabilities within, within their own um, organization mm -hmm. such that we're willing to do business with them because they meet our expectations for that service. Great, thank you both. Let me take one more question, maybe two more. You mentioned a few times doing certain things in a workshop model. And the question is, given everything that we've learned during the past year, year and a half with the COVID-19 pandemic, do the teams need to be co-located physically together or can the service delivery model operate virtually? I'll take this one, John, and then maybe you can pick the last one up. Um, so this is, uh, this is a, a very interesting question. And we have had several clients who've asked that we build um, new service delivery models with the intent on being virtual from the get-go. We are not going to co-locate. And so it certainly can work. And we have seen that uh, folks are often more productive when working virtually. But I think as we've uh, learned over time and as, as the, the pandemic is beginning to wane, most of our clients are moving toward a hybrid model. They recognize the value of being um, remote because it, it certainly makes it more flexible and folks can be productive. But at the same time, uh, people begin to lose their part of the culture of being part of the company. They begin to feel like an independent contractor and you may see turnover begin to increase. And so you have to really balance making sure that employees are engaged, that they're co-located when they need to be, but you also allow the flexibility for being remote when required. And so I think a more hybrid model seems to be the approach that we're seeing uh, many of our organizations take. I'll just tag along with your comments, Trey. Um, one of the elements of service delivery that we've discussed on this call is the technology enablement and what um, the hybrid work from home in office, not co-located model 
um, places an emphasis on is how can your staff still provide service? Uh, and often that ends up being through service enabling technologies. So it ends up becoming a point of emphasis in the model design um, to keep their employees connected in a service way. Great, great. So I'm gonna try and squeeze in one more question here before we wrap up. What is the role of an end-to-end -end process owner for procure to pay in this model? Do you wanna tackle that? I, I can jump in. So um, we think that an end-to-end -end process owner is important, uh, especially if you have um, pay AP in your model. So it's important to think about them. Um, oftentimes we'll see an end-to-end -end process owner report, oftentimes they don't report to the person responsible for execution, but rather to a different person within the organization, but they're responsible for end-to-end -end process design. They're responsible for end-to-end -end metrics. They're responsible for end-to-end -end, um, process improvement and continuous improvement. And so we find it to be very valuable. Um, typically it would report to a head of shared services. If this reports to a shared services organization, uh, it may report to a uh, kind of a, a governance board or a committee uh, that oversees this model. Um, but we try not to tie the the, the end end process owner to execution. It typically, we tend to see those two things separated. One person responsible for executing the model and the other responsible for the end-to-end -end upstream and downstream design. Very interesting, thank you. So just uh, wanted to let everyone on the webinar know, we have some additional content if you wanna learn more. Um, as both Trey and John have mentioned metrics, APQC has some information available on measures and metrics for benchmarking your sourcing and procurement. Um, we've also looked at things like AI and the new skills that you need to work with AI in supply chain roles. So I encourage everyone to take a look at that. We also have some additional information on Scott Madden if you'd like to learn more about the opportunities that they provide. And lastly, some contact information for today's presenters. Do feel free to reach out to them following the webinar via email and both of their emails are on the screen for you. I wanna thank everyone for joining us today and I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you very much, John and Trey.